Here we are back with Culinary Growth and Development Live, and we are going to kick off our culinary history lesson with Master Chef Olivier Andrini, longtime friend and mentor, as we continue down our path of uh, of our discussion of Nouvelle Cuisine and our, our two of our chefs today. So uh, today we're going to talk quite a bit about uh, Alain Chapelle and uh, Roger Verger. So um, welcome, Chef. It's good to see you again. I always love these sessions with you. Welcome, Chef. It's great to be there. I got nothing else to do than talking to you on Sunday. Well, see, it's perfect. And, uh, you know, as, as our audience starts to grow, we'll, uh, we'll have to do many, many more of these. So maybe we'll, maybe we'll up the amount that we do so we can, you know, really get you know, busy. So you mean I have, to, I have to shower more often? Yeah, I mean, if you're open to it. Or, I mean, uh, the bright side of technology, right, is that nobody can smell you yet, so... <laughs> yet <laughs> yet we haven't thank you they haven't worked that out yet so um so let's see i guess uh if you haven't joined us in a while or if this is your first time with us we've been going through this uh this set of books um les recettes original right which um i don't know chef andrini uh, introduced me to quite some time ago probably what 22 23 years ago by uh robert lafont and uh, we started talking about Ferdinand Poin, and then it wasn't a, a far jump from Ferdinand Poin to Bocuse. And then from Bocuse, we started talking about Nouvelle Cuisine and some of the others that were related to him, right? So I think our last session, we talked about Trois Gros. And now we find ourselves with uh, Alain Chapelle and Roger Verger. So as we're talking about Nouvelle Cuisine, uh, I think today we were going to lead off with Roger Verger. Is that right? Yeah, I think so. Okay. I okay. think we have lots of uh, things to say and you be there because I remember you coming to me and say, chef, I want to compete. You have to help me. <laughs> that was in the what, 17th century? In the 17th century. <laughs> 2000, actually. Were, that, was in, that was in 2000. Yeah. It's a long time ago, huh? How time flies. I mean, yeah. Yeah. I remember you asking and I say, I never compete. So what the heck you want me to do? He said, I don't care. You're going to help me. Because I want to win that things and go to France, yeah. and you did. And so I did. You went there. You went to Verger. So I'm sure you have a lot of things to say about that. You you've been there. I was not there. Well, I had a lot of fun putting the lesson together today because I was diving through some old pictures that I haven't looked at in quite some time. So, um, you know, one of one of my favorite things that I've that I've done, and I'm glad my brother encouraged me to do it, was carry a camera for a long time. So I've always had a camera with me. And uh, at least starting in 2000, I started taking pictures of everything. So but um, I, I guess one of the. Go ahead. Go ahead. I say I think it's one of the best way to get great souvenir is by taking picture. Yeah. Yeah. Otherwise, you end up with a lot of shit that you don't know what to do with. Exactly. Or you think then you remember and you actually you don't. No. If you cannot look at it, you don't remember exactly how it was. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, and it's funny because yep. I think I look at the pictures and I I realize what I was focused on back in the day, uh, you know, and, and what I'm focused on now, how much that's changed. I, I don't know if you remember or if you know, but in, in, in that region of the world, there's quite a few topless beaches, you know. Um, <laughs> I forgot where my focus was 22 years ago. That's for certain. Um, but it was a, it, it's a great focus because it's a beautiful place. It is a beautiful place, um, but all of our pictures today come from the restaurant, so I've narrowed that search <laughs> down a little bit. But uh, let's uh, let's lead a little bit with um, with with Nouvelle Cuisine. Actually, I, it's funny, right? Because Nouvelle Cuisine was was just kind of starting. What in the late sixties? Yeah. Well, in the mid to yeah. late sixties, right? And I would say by 1985, it kind of ran its course, correct? Yeah, the change you needed to be made were made. Yeah. And then we start mentioning it. It was Nouvelle Cuisine, but it's still kind of 
when you think of it, the majority of the things we do today are related to that. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's actually, it's really interesting how um, I, was, I was reading and as I was brushing up on Nouvelle Cuisine and its transition, how, you know, in France, it was classical cuisine, la cuisine classique, up until Nouvelle Cuisine in the 60s. And then mm -hmm. kind of after Nouvelle Cuisine came out of fashion, a lot of cooking techniques stayed like, well, I mean, I think you could say Beurre Blanc is a result of Nouvelle Cuisine. I think you would say uh -huh. that um, uh, Jus is a result of, of Nouvelle Cuisine. I think you could say that uh, reduction or uh, what we would call demi-glace today would be a result yeah. of Nouvelle Cuisine as opposed to demi-glace from what Escoffier would call it. Yep. Yep. I agree. hundred percent. That's exactly what happened. Yeah. And one of the things who always make me laugh when we talk about Nouvelle Cuisine, one of their rules was to, you use the freshest product around you. Mm -hmm. And today we, we talk about farm to table and blah, blah, blah. Well, that was done in the sixties. Yes. It's nothing new. Mm -hmm. It's funny. To look back that that's exactly what this dude dude done they were doing the farm to table yep well and they were embracing well it's funny like uh, i don't know if you can see it on your screen but number eight new techniques you know i remember seeing in verger's kitchen when i was with them a microwave we used a microwave for some of the dishes i, I don't know yep. if you remember me telling you that that they're uh the, the lamb kidneys we cooked the lamb kidneys in the microwave yeah, 45 sure. seconds I mean, and let them oh, rest, you know, like it's yeah. crazy. Yeah, I know then in the, at that time in the Paul Bocuse restaurant was a microwave. Yeah. I know that, that's for sure. We didn't talk about it, but that was something they used. That was Nouvelle Technique. Well, and, and the yeah. guidelines for Nouvelle Cuisine were established by Henry Go and uh, what was the other gentleman's name? Ido. Milo, what Milo. was his first name? Yeah. Um, Do you remember? Milo. Was it? Oof. Yeah, I would remember if you give me ten minutes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I have, I have, I have my notes all over the place too. So, um, Henry Christian, uh, Christian Milo. Christian. Yeah, Christian Henri Go and Christian Milo. Yeah. Yep. And they uh, and they created the the guide me uh, the Go Milo Nouvelle Guide. Yep. And so then they I established. Mean, Nouvelle Christine. Nouvelle Cuisine is, is a word D came out with, none of the chef. That were, that's that magazine, Goemio, who came up with the word Nouvelle Cuisine. And I was reading, actually, that that was, that was partially, or, well, Bocuse claimed it was partially in response to the development of the cuisine that they were serving for the Concorde. Yep, exactly. Yep. Absolutely right. Do you think yep. that that's do you think that's accurate that that claim, or do you think that it just it coincided, or or do you think it, do you think one was the result of the other? I think one was the result of the other. I think, but that's me. You were there, you know, chef. I mean, it's <laughs> I was there, and yeah. I mean that respectfully, okay. chef. I completely. It's just that you know, it's. When I, I mean, come on, I was, I was learning how to cook, you know, after, after Nouvelle Cuisine was out of fashion. And that's when, you know, I would say Nouvelle Cuisine kind of it became kind of a bad name, you know, it became a bad word because it went way far off the spectrum. Yeah. Yeah. Way far. Way far. Small yeah. portions, like overpriced. Even, yeah. Even Verger say so. He say Nouvelle Cuisine is a, was a joke at one point. Yeah. 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 Did he serve anything with whatever? Did he think it was Japanese? Huge plate, no food in it, but big price. And very expensive. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's, it's funny how things go like from not enough to too much. Yeah. We, instead of stopping in the middle, now he goes completely at the other extreme and makes no sense no more. Well, I mean, it's the same. Yeah. I, it, it's funny, but it's the same thing with fashion, right? Things go out of style and then 20 years they'll be back. Yep. And then they'll go that's out of why style. You never, and... Yeah. That's why you never throw away anything that you, and you, you own as far as clothing because 20 years down the road, you can wear them again. It'll be back. If you don't become too, too fat. Yeah. 
Well, that's a whole nother story. That's a whole nother conversation uh, on a whole nother yes, level. Yes, sir. So um, I guess uh, you want to run through these real quick? I, I mean, I, it's funny because I think it's actually, it's it's very much so a guide of how we cook today. I don't think a lot's changed. Uh, rejection of excessive complications in cooking. I would say what's changed now more than anything is maybe the desire to add new techniques that don't make any sense with lack of understanding um, and tweezers. I think tweezers are tweezers weren't popular in the 1970s. I don't think anybody was no. using fucking tweezers in the 1970s. Um, let's see. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> let's see. Cooking time for most products reduced to preserve natural flavors. I, I This one actually, I... I had to think about, I had to process this, this piece, right? Thinking my whole life, there's always been a temperature for things. You know, when I learned how to cook duck, we learned how to cook duck to temperature. It was, I had to unlearn that in order to learn that classical roasted duck was cooked through. Yeah, completely true. And yeah. the same thing with fish, as we were talking about with uh, what, what, the Trois Gros brothers, as they were talking about cooking the salmon. Yeah. Yeah, and nouvelle cuisine changed the things of like fish, it's a perfect example. The fish were completely overcooked before. And then with nouvelle cuisine, they became a little bit more precise on the cooking. They say pink to the bone, kind mm. of. That was part of the, the rose à l'arrête. You were saying that's where you stop cooking their their veg were cooked less also. In the old days, veg were cooked and cooked and cooked and cooked till the kind of mash get a funny, funny look and yeah, and no texture. Yeah. So that changed definitely. The it's third so one, interesting. It was well, so interesting to think about that that was new in the 1960s. You know, like it's you take for granted so much of what happened before your time when you don't know it. You know, I think the majority of the people listening to you today don't have a clue Then earlier it was not like it is today. Oh, I'm sure. I would say it's highly because, likely. Yeah, they learn it the way it is now. They don't have a chance to, like me, well, I, I learned it the other way first. Well, and that's why I do these culinary history lessons. So, you know, I mean, it's it's perfect that yeah. we're talking about this because quite honestly... There's some pieces in here that I've never heard before that I really haven't heard in years. And unless you're taught, you don't really know. There's no way to That's know. That's true. You're not just, I mean, uh, where how, do you, we, how, we, how do you stumble yeah. across learning about Nouvelle Cuisine? I mean, okay, maybe if you're looking at, maybe if you're looking at a cookbook from the early 2000s, maybe there's a reference, maybe. But by now, not many people are really talking about it. Or maybe you're looking at a cookbook like the Trot, like the Charlie Trotter cookbooks in the 90s. And they may yep. talk about it a little bit as where they came from. But again, if you're not looking back at that stuff, you're, you're probably not going to stumble across it. No. Mm -mm. Nope. And so to your point, this, this next item, number three, the cuisine was made with the freshest possible ingredients. And this is where the, the local thing comes into play. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. They say, they say in the book, when you read the book of uh, Chappelle, they say he knew every farmer who grow any food who came to his restaurant. He knew them by name. He knew where were the farm. He went there. That's crazy. It's, it's farm to table. Right. Just well, and well, and our earlier. first exposure to that in America was Alice Waters, right? In the 70s, late yeah. 70s? Late 70s. Yep. Uh, yep. Chez Panisse, right? Uh-huh. Okay. Yep. And yeah, she was one of the first one to follow that these rules. Right. Yeah. Yep. And it's so funny because it starting with better product immediately leads you to better end results. Mm-hmm. I I would I would definitely be behind that one. You if can't you fix bad food, that's for sure. You cannot fix bad produce by making good food. It can be. Right. If you start with the bad things, then you're just going to end up with something bad. Right. For sure. But, yeah. So number three, I like it. It's a good one. 
Yeah. And then large the menu things. Yeah. Huh? Go ahead. The menu things is interesting because being an apprentice in the late 60s, the menu were freaking huge. Hmm. You know, it was like to give you this menu were like that and you were sitting there 20 minutes reading the first pages, then you flip and then you go, what was on the first pages again? It was just huge. Yeah, it was interesting. And that changed a little bit with the menu from all these guys. When you look at the menu, my parents, I don't know where I have it somewhere. My parents went to the Twog Hall and brought back the menu. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like that. It's not that many things on it because they are more precise and that's what they want you to eat because that's right now seasonal. I can find it. I want to cook that. Right. And that's all they're cooking so that they cook that and the next day they cook whatever is at that moment the right thing. Yeah, exactly. Don't ask them to do anything with tomato in January. They're not going to do it. Right. Because tomatoes suck in January. It doesn't matter where you are. They're not good. Unless yeah. you're maybe in the Southern Hemisphere, maybe. Yeah, I don't know. Maybe. The um, Georgia. Well, number five, strong marinades for product. And this was, this was something that I, I definitely learned. In classical cooking, there were a lot of really strong marinades used to overcome the low quality or the questionable freshness of meat. I think that's what it was. I mean, because the refrigeration was not very good. The, the where their truck, they moved the things were not refrigerated. So, yeah. yeah. And if and you're not using it, when you receive it, then by the two day later, you get a funny uh, smell. Well, and so, if, you've ne if you've never looked at the recipes for Le Guide Culinaire for his meat marinades, it's it's crazy how intense they are and how, I don't know if I'd say impractical, but how out of style they would be today. You know, really aggressive wine, heavily spiced, heavily seasoned, um, really intense flavors. Not necessarily mm -hmm. about the flavor of the meat. I mean, not necessarily fitting for the day anymore, but definitely uh, it makes sense to see that for a transition to a new style of cuisine. Mm -hmm. And then here's what we were talking next. Number six, heavy sauces such as Espanol and Bechamel were replaced by fresh herbs, high quality butter, lemon juice, and vinegar. So to the point earlier, this was when a beurre blanc came about, right? Yep. Mm-hmm. Definitely using very good wine, good vinegar, then make that nice production. And beurre blanc at that time, or still today, when you say a beurre blanc has no cream, it has only butter. Right. When you want to add cream to make it stable, it's a beurre nante, and it's nothing wrong with that. It right. came out more or less at the same time. Right. But it was but just a splash of cream to stabilize yeah. the sauce. So you can keep it during during service. Well, and for anybody who doesn't know, why Nantes? Because they come from the city of Nantes in France, where around that area, they have amazing cow give incredible milk who Make through the system cream. give yeah. great butter. So they use the cream and the butter from there. And yeah, uh, Nantes. If you so remember at school, we had the, the French dude, uh, Koyak. Okay. Gerard Koyak, uh -huh. of the chef. He was right. from Nantes, and he was so proud of his burnout. <laughs> it was funny. Yeah. It was funny. Yeah. Was I, funny. I, I, I never knew that that's where he was from. Yeah, he was from Nantes. Hmm. Yeah. It's a Nantes. So now this next one, regional dishes replaced cuisine classique as source of inspiration. So now we're looking at things like uh, Lyonnaise or um, those particular. Provençal. Say again. A la Provençal. When you're uh, talking about Verger, what he done? He opened the first restaurant and then opened the second one and went straight to cuisine Provençal. Not any more of the classical. Not no. Very regional. Mm -hmm. I think that's what we still do today when you think of it. We are very, well, we should be very regional. Not everybody is, but you get better product if you stay around where you are to buy. Right. And you serve a higher quality of food because you have a higher quality of raw product to begin with. Yep. 
and things of or matching together because they came from the same area with the same terroir. Right. So the food are matching together. Naturally. I mean, when you think, yeah, when you think of all these three-star Michelin, and we talked from the Trois Gros to, to Chapelle to Marc Meneau is another one we didn't cover. They all have vineyard around where they live, where their wine for the restaurant comes from there because he fits the rest of the ingredient. He has the same, again, same dirt, same terroir. So yes. the flavor are mixing very well together. And you don't even have to try. Nope. Nope. <laughs> nope. So in so it's, it's funny, funny because in some ways it's just, it's a lot easier. It's, it's complicated, but it's still a lot simpler to make everything fit together. Well, you just look today at California and look at the lady you just mentioned to her Alice name. Alice Waters, Waters, yeah. Alice Water. Where she is, she's just outside San yeah. Francisco. She's yeah. in Oakland. Mm -hmm. And they have the wine there. Berkeley. Yeah, she in Berkeley? Berkeley, yeah. Yeah, yeah Berkeley. They have the, the, the Napa and Sanoma at their doors. You have all the veg in the south. You, you have everything. And that's exactly what she do. She follow the rules. Yep. Exactly that. Yep. Yeah. And her food was really simple. Properly handled. Mm -hmm. Mature. Yep. I, was, I guess mature is the right way to say it. It wasn't a lot of unnecessary additions to things. No frou-frou. Well said. <laughs> That's what we say in French. They remove all the foo foo and keep the food in my plate. Just get to the cooking. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. We'll get back there sooner or later. Uh huh. Instead of everything having yeah, a little we... petite salad on it nowadays. It's okay. As long as the salad is from your garden. Yeah, uh, that, that's a good point. Yeah. So we talked for a second about new techniques embraced as well as new equipment. And I guess new techniques, Burblanc, Blanc, new equipment, the microwave, um, the steamer. The steamer was something that was really used at this time. And, and this is actually really truly when sous vide actually began, right? In the, in the early yeah. 70s. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Wasn't everything for the Concord done in sous vide? Or Part not of everything? It, yeah. I, I, but a piece. But a big part of it. Yeah. Yeah. In it the was 70s. Very difficult. Yeah. Yeah. And the train, too, they were serving the TGV, you know, all these train with big restaurants on the train were yes. serving food sous vide because it was much more easy than trying to use a frying pan in something who moves around. And yeah. Mm. It was funny because you, you, I was teaching at the CIA and we were talking about sous vide. I want to do sous vide and you were, were nobody using it. I'm like, come on, guys, they're using it for 30 years. Why can it be so bad? Yeah. Why do we don't go with the, the flow? Well, it's bad when it's, it's done poorly, for sure. Well, yeah. As is yeah. anything, though. As anything else. Yes, yes. sir. Mm -hmm. This is interesting. Attention was paid to dietary needs by the chefs. So where they was act, they were actually trying to put some nutritional balance into a plate, more vegetable, a little bit less starch, less less fat. Yep. Yeah, try to balance that dish a lot better than it was done before. And it's so funny that they were trying to do this fifty years ago. And mm -hmm. what you can't read because the screen cut it off and I can't seem to uh, pull it up. I, I, there we are without smashing our faces here. The chefs were invented and created new combinations and pairings. So do you, th can you think of, I don't know, a, 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 like an epic pairing that came from this time? Anything come to mind? More, yeah, if we go back to the last show we done together, we talk about the trois gros and the pairing of the salmon with the sorrel, sorrel. and the cream, and that that was new. Yeah, that okay. was not something. That's one of them. They also have a, a salmon dish at the trois gros with cucumber. 
Okay. As a vegetable in it was super good. Hmm. That was also kind of on the new side. Yeah. Cool. I'm sure it's a million other one. It's just nothing crossed my mind now. But when we're going to talk about Chapelle, we're going to talk about some of the dishes. And when we get there, we cross the line. Well, and I think with Verge, we can do the same thing too, because he, you know, he started, he, was interesting for me that he used a lot of the Provencal herbs with his de- with his fruit for his desserts. You know, there was a a big pairing there for him, um, and and so I, I think the best way to transition here is is the fact that obviously if this was in the seventies and this was taking place in the you know the mid to late sixties into the seventies, these were chefs who were kind of heading into their prime right around that time yep. right so you know yeah. that leads us to some of the other i guess we could call them fathers of nouvelle cuisine as we're talking about alain chapelle and roger verge and and let's start with uh with verge right he was born mm-hmm. in what in 1930 30. yep april 1930 april 7th in actually, a little a couple days after my birthday yep april 7th yeah. mm-hmm and s- in a little place called Commentry, on mm-hmm. the Allier area of France, which is a little north of Lyon, if you want to. Okay. Like when I say a little, no, a little, I'm going to say, I don't know, 50, 60 kilometers north mm-hmm. of Lyon. Yeah, that's where yeah. he was born and when that's where he kind of started to uh, train. His first training restaurant was there on his city in Commentry. What at a place called uh, Bourbonnet, the Bour- yeah Bourbonnet. The chef there was Alexis Charrier. Mm-hmm. That's where he started. Yeah, and then as we know, then he went down to Paris, and went to La Tour d'Argent. Uh-huh. Who's still there today? Still do all these things, and he also went to the Plaza Athene in Paris, which is one of the best hotel in France. Yeah, so he went there. That's why he keeps doing his training. And then the funny part, he went to Africa. Yep. Which definitely leads to, which I think really had a huge contribution to what we'll talk about in a few minutes here, which was his uh, Ma Cuisine du Soleil, the cuisine of the sun, right? Northern Africa yep. is is on the Mediterranean. And I'm sorry I didn't pull up another map, but it's literally, it's so as much as France is on the Mediterranean, North Africa is yeah. literally just opposite the Mediterranean Sea. Yeah. If you're in the south of France and you look straight ahead, what do you see? North Africa. Right. Yep. So that's where he went. He went. He, he worked in Morocco, Algeria, and even went to Kenya. Yep. That's what so I have. Gonna, gonna, yeah. Yeah. Done a good trip there. Mansour de Casablanca, Loasis. Yep. <coughs> and then he found his way to Monte Carlo. Yep. Then he came back and went at the Hotel de Paris in Monaco. Yep. At Monte Carlo, yep. Yep. Yeah, which is all it's down funny. here, which is known as the, the, the Côte d'Azur. Yep, exactly. Yes. It's the... Yeah. I the mean, French, the French Riviera. The it doesn't get much more ideal, actually. I mean, it's it's so funny because there's so many beautiful places along the coast, right? Be it from Spain to Italy to Greece, but this is this is the French hotspot. Definitely, yeah. Oh yeah, it is the place to be. I mean, where he was situated, he, he could in Cannes. He have this huge film festival every year with all the movie stars and all these people and he had a restaurant right there so people would go to him for dinner so he, he served all these people yeah he, i mean he, he grabbed the right spot there mm-hmm. he was very smart well and and just a little ways to the south it's actually it's not on here but there's also central pay right like central pays yeah just there ish right and then you know, if you continue further down, then you find yourself in Barcelona. And I mean, literally, like, I, I, that's, I know Barcelona is yep. a long trip away, but you're, you're still not far from Marseille. You're not far from Monaco. Nope. 
Yeah. No. Yeah, yeah. Monaco, Nice, nice. Cannes, yeah. Antibes. It's, yeah. It's yeah. all around the same coast. Yeah. It's a beautiful place and a lot of money there. Tons and tons of money. Yeah. Yeah. When you look at the, for the people who follow Formula One racing, when you go in Monaco and you see the boat because it's on the, on the oh, yeah. water and you yeah. see the, the, the harbor with all the, the yachts there, it's incredible. Yeah, you know yeah. how much money it's there. Yeah, the ten million dollar yachts don't fit. Like, there's not enough room. That's for a that. little. That's that's a yeah. little one. You have to park those yeah, what, elsewhere. Yeah. Yeah. Where exactly? Yeah. Yeah. It's exactly that. It's funny. No. It, so yeah, it, you opened that restaurant. Um, 1969. Yep. Yeah. You, Nin you 1969. The, first... the the Moulin de Mougin. Yeah. Exactly. And that's where you, you went at one point, huh? Mm -hmm. You yeah, first was... went to the other one and then went there? Le Mandier, yeah. I spent some time at Le Mandier before they let me cook at this restaurant. Like, I guess like we've talked about in the past, right? With so many of these, you know, Michelin three-star facilities or these world-class mm -hmm. operations, they, they want you, they want to make sure you're at a particular level before they put you in their high-end place. And so I went and spent some time at... Um, Le Mandier, which is, uh, I don't know, maybe a half an hour from, from Le Moulin de Moujan. And uh, I spent eh, three days there doing mise en place, and then they let me come back. So they let me work here after that. <laughs> so, so I think I did okay. I didn't, spend, I didn't spend three months there. You know, I, I, got, I spent three days. They were okay with me and did all right. Just to put a time frame on it, when you think of it, so he opened the Moulin de Moja in 69. Mm -hmm. In 70, he get his first Michelin star. In 72, he get the second one. And in 74, he get the third one. And then three years later, 77, he went on and opened the Lamandier where you were first. Right. So he, he first worked to get the three star mm -hmm. and then went and opened the other one. Right. Yep. And that's also where he, he founded his school, right? The L'Ecole de yes. Cuisine du Soleil. Yeah. And I think exactly. that that happened as he was transitioning away from Nouvelle Cuisine, right? Because he, like we talked about, he he was a big piece of Nouvelle, but then he fell out of love with Nouvelle because it became ridiculous. Yeah. Yeah, and you, you want to be more Provencal? Well, yeah, more around you, exactly. So he wants to, to do the cuisine niçoise, the cuisine Provencal. He wants to that he wants to spend his time in that. So he kind of let go a little bit the nouvelle things mm -hmm. and went more to his area, regional, I would say. Which yeah. he is in the region of Provence, if we hadn't mentioned that, right? Like this is yeah. this is Provence. When when you talk about that Provence, Herbe de Provence is from this area of France, this southeastern yeah. region, right off of the coast. Yeah, which Just borders which borders Italy and Switzerland, right? Uh, not Switzerland, but Italy on one side. Mm -hmm. Switzerland is on top of of it a little bit. So a little too far north. I mean, you mean France, that area? Yeah, we board with them, but not Provence. Okay. It's the, oh, which department? Nice, huh? See, I've been gone so long, I cannot even remember the name. It's okay. It's all right. We'll it's move okay. on. We'll just move past that and come back to it at another time. Yeah. So, uh, interesting so, piece, but the Moulin, right? A Moulin is actually the wheel that's used to crush olives and flour. It's a mill, right? It's a mill, yeah. yeah. Usually water-powered. Usually, usually, sometimes wind, mm -hmm. but okay. usually water. And when they say a moulin, they usually talk of the one who do the flour. Okay. When you say a moulin, it's where you have the, the guy who makes the flour. <laughs> well, and so yeah. what was cool about this is this is right inside the front door. And like I said, I, I, I got to, I, I 
had the benefit of going there and, and spending a few months there as long as I could until I had to leave. Um, and this was the original Mulan from the original Mulan de Mujan, which is literally what this place was in Mujan. So this is where the mill was. And that was the original stone mill. <laughs> Interesting, no? Do you know how old, you know how old that was? I remember them saying it, but I don't remember off. The, I don't remember what it was. I know. I mean, okay. it, if you look at it, it's it's got some years on it for sure. Yeah, and that picture is twenty years ago, more than twenty years ago. That yeah, picture, twenty one. I was there in two thousand, or I was there in uh, two thousand and one. So yeah, so now okay. twenty one years ago. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know if that's still really? there, but you know, I remember. I, I would imagine it is, but I don't know. It's been a long time. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I um, think it's a long time. Yeah, so that's that's how his restaurant got his name, right? It was the Moulin. It was mm -hmm. the mill in Muj in the town of Mujan, and known for their Provencal cuisine. Yep. And he was also uh, quite the art collector, right? Yeah, he loved the art. So he spent a fortune buying art and and painting. Then he would display inside the restaurant. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, he, if I remember the story right, there, there's also a story that artists used to need a place to stay. And so he would offer them a room or he would offer them rooms for art. So he would allow people to stay at his hotel with the fee being art. Okay, that's smart. Yeah, so when he was first getting started in the 70s, that's the, the story as I understand it was that was how he started his art collection, was he would allow artists to stay if they would provide him art. Hmm. That's a good way. Yeah. And so he ended up having these really cool, beautiful spaces. And I know a lot of this stuff isn't there anymore because I was looking online to see after it changed hands if the art was still there. But uh, a lot of the art kind of moved along or got so I don't know what happened to it, but I know a lot of it wasn't there. But sculptures in the garden. I know this was one of his apparently one of his favorite sculptures. Like this was where he he liked to have his coffee in this area in the morning. Just interesting um and this was yeah, on the way too. yeah not bad to look at for sure no exactly i like that yeah and that was actually right on the way to the um to the garden where we would get our tomatoes and a lot of our herbs and the majority of the trees around there were um um bay leaf laurier mm -hmm. they were everywhere um, yeah down there and they grow very well like weeds everywhere. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, so the you know, the this was my first experience with real Michelin three star experience. They had two stars when I was there, but um, it was my first time really seeing what a Giardon could be at work or what a cheese platter, you know, what a cheese cart looked like, or um, watching seeing the dining room, seeing really amazing service and it was cool. Towards the end of my time there, they actually allowed me to come in and sit and have dinner, which uh, at lunch, it was lunch. But it ended, by the time I got done, it was dinner. Uh, really, but that was my first exposure. I was 21 years old. And I would say that my time here truly changed the trajectory of my career tremendously. Yeah, all of a sudden you realize what you want to do. And what could be done. Yeah, you know? what's possible. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it was strange they did the split shift. That was strange for me. But at the same time, cooking beautiful ingredients nicely, like, you know, butchering, breaking down animals, seeing product that I had never seen or never understood the same way. Like, uh, here we have strawberries. I remember one of the days they brought in fraise de bois, wild strawberries, mm -hmm. the little guys. And yep. I don't know, I, I feel like... Not a day went by that my life, my perspective on existence was changed <laughs> because, you know, the, the ducks would come in warm. They were, they had their necks broken and they were plucked that morning and they came in warm. Like that was how we got duck. And um, my first job 
at this restaurant was um, taking the insides out of the ducks and then hanging them so that they could age in the refrigerator. Some of them, we, some of them, most of them we cleaned. Some of them we would hold for the special guests that Verge, you know, knew wanted a uh, more fragrant duck. Faisande? Faisande, yeah. The, the word is faisande, like the word faisande, the bird. Mm -hmm. Faisande, it's like when you keep the bird with all the stuff in and you let it age a little bit. A little bit, so until little the leg. <laughs> We're not going to go. But yeah, faisande. Yep. So, mm -hmm. um, okay, so let's see. Keep it moving. Um, so, I have some pictures that we can walk through. Go ahead. What, do you, what were you going to say? I was saying another thing he done in 82, he went with Paul Bocuse and Gaston Lenotre, the French pastry chef. He went to Florida and opened at the Walt Disney World. He opened that French restaurant called Les Chefs de France. At Epcot, right? It's still there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the restaurant is still there and it's... Paul Bocu's son, Jérôme, mm -hmm. was in charge of it. Right. Today. Yeah, that's where Jérôme works. Yeah. So Verge was the open, the first guy with Bocuse and Lenot. I mean, they were the three partners to open that. Right. Yeah. And it wouldn't be there if it wasn't. No. No, you're absolutely right. Another well, thing we, we talked earlier about is what a guy that we know today who have big name who went through his kitchen to learn. Remember, we talk about that. We say, like, I didn't know that Alain Ducasse yeah. worked there. In 1977. Yeah. yeah. Imagine. And the American guy, David Boulay, yeah. was there. We made a big name for himself. And Daniel Boulou. Mm -hmm. Or French boy from Lyon. Yeah. Was yeah, stay there. So well, we were talking about this too. Phil Tessier, the you know, the the first American to podium at the Boku's door. He was he was there for uh, for a few for a little bit of time. I think it was a year. I think he was there he was there six months or a year, something like that. Hmm. Yep. What what are the picture behind you or beside you or depending on how we look at it? Uh, well, so this was the pass, and and he had this really interesting style where he took his he would collect his uh, broken plates and broken glass, and since he was very artsy, he he had this very um, artsy flower design for the rims of his plates, and so then he would take these broken plates, and when he had his kitchen redone, he had them kind of embed in the wall. Um, I don't know if you can see that. All right. It's not the yeah. clearest picture, but yeah, it was, uh, so yeah, so this was the past and I don't know if you can see the silver tray. Um, yeah, yeah, this it's cool going back down memory lanes. And then this is where we would clean the ducks in the morning. This was, you know, first thing I, I literally, my first day on, we had, uh, 24 ducks to clean. So, um, I think I did a decent job because I got to spend time with everybody else too. So again, that's, I guess that's always the gauge, right? If you get, if you're at the job for a long time, then you're probably not doing a great job. <laughs> yeah. Um, that's the gauge. Usually. Um, and then, you know, I was, I was really surprised to see how much they, they used the, the steamer cream. and the microwave. This was a yeah. this was a steamer and and this was a really high powered steamer and this was how they would cook lobsters a la minute and this is how they would um, you know steam I don't know zucchini flowers they would steam écrevisse you know uh, crawfish like they would do langoust and they and they would they would really steam it a la minute as quickly as humanly possible break it down very quickly and it would find its way to its plate very very quickly not. You know, they, they weren't pre-killing lobsters. They weren't pre-cooking lobsters. Uh, that was something that was interesting to me because, you know, the restaurant was busy. We would do some some covers. We we had business that we would do. And so the processes for some of these things were surprising to me. How many people were in the kitchen? Was it a huge kitchen? Uh, it was a fairly large kitchen. I would... If I remember right, there were uh, four people on the meat side, four people on fish, five people in pastry, and then 
there was usually a, a, a prep crew that was there in the morning for mise en place and then cleaning throughout the rest of the day. Hmm. Yeah. The, the kitchen was so cool though. Um, again, really life changing. And I, I couldn't, I, I never really took a picture of it while I was there. But one of the cool things they did was they had this um, epoxy seal on their floor and all of their devices with all of the electrical was piped up like, um, let me figure out how I can explain this. So if the floor, I don't know if you can see that. Yeah. So if the floor is here, right, it was all coated with epoxy. There would be like a two inch plastic pipe that would come up about a foot and then all of the water, all of the electric, all of the all of the um, utility stuff would go into this pipe through the floor. So there were no wires on the floor. There was no electricity in the kitchen except a couple outlets up high. And then at the end of the day, we would pressure wash the floor and squeegee the floor into these drains. Like it was the kitchen was really set up to be clean, clean. and cleaned very well and cleaned very efficiently. Yeah, that's cool. Really interesting. Yeah. The first time I'd ever seen that. And they, you know, um, I, I'll have to look and see if I can find some pictures of that. But I, I know I'd never seen anything like that before this. Um, and then uh, I thought it was funny. I was looking back and I can't remember if this was um, was a bonnet, uh, but I, I, I was looking a little closer and I noticed that he had his little his own little nameplates on his uh, yeah. cooking suite. I thought that was um, specifically That's Michelin three star. <laughs> Exactly. That's what I said. That goes with the third star. Yeah. Yeah. The yeah, silver definitely. and the copper plates with your name. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and then we had yeah, some absolutely. food, which right. this was in 2000. And, and so I would say probably a little more modern than it was in the 80s. Um, but I do remember some people saying that his food in the 80s was very modern as well. So this wasn't a huge change from what he was serving. Um, some of the things that I, I thought were really interesting that I saw here was he would do savory fruit sorbets. Um, that was a common thing in his menus. He would do like a tomato sorbet, not sweet, savory. Um, and he would, he would play that line of sweet and savory quite a bit with his desserts. He would use herbs and spices and kind of ride that line to savory as well. Um, Foie gras terrine, the first time I'd ever seen a foie gras terrine quite like this. Um, and um, yeah, that was black truffle. Oh. Yeah, with the aspic on the plate, right? Like I thought that was funny, but it's 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 cool because I think it's nicely done. It's a, it's a little dated, yes, but it was yeah. really well, delicious. It was delicious and it exactly. served a purpose. Yeah. Yep, um, I'm sure it, it must be taste very, very good together. And, uh, and then again, as I was looking, um, black truffles and green beans, simple, but again, a great memory. And this was something I think a lot of people take for granted. Some people know the preparation on Barigol. Barigol. And I think people may have heard of it, but I don't know if people yeah. know that this is where it came from. I don't know who would know that. But this is where I learned it, and uh, it's such a cool, cool preparation, such a great preparation for artichokes, and uh, literally, like that's the dish, right? <laughs> you can't, yep. you can't get much more Provencal than that. And he was also responsible for what the petit farci, the little stuffed vegetables in the style of Provence. Yep. Um, yep. So yeah, just I, I thought it was cool going back through the food because again, at two thousand or in two thousand. I, I, I still think this is, you know, modern, beautiful food today. Apricots and uh, apricots with pistachios and, and basil. And you had even mentioned uh, pea stew and pesto, right? Yeah. Um, yeah, we're asking, like, lots of people never understand the difference, which is funny, between pea stew and pesto because they're coming from very close together. I mean, the border of France and Italy, it's not that far away from that restaurant. Correct. You don't, you're not driving three hours, you're driving what, 15, 20 minutes maybe, yeah. I guess. Mm -hmm. It's yeah. not far. And you're in Italy, no, no. So the Italian do the pesto, the 
people in the province do the piece too. And I was thinking, I don't know who would know the difference, but the difference is on the pesto, on the Italian one, you have the basil, the olive oil, the garlic, plus the pine nuts and the cheese, usually Parmesan or Pecorino. The French one, the piece too, has only the first three. You only eat basil, olive oil and garlic, and it's a little bit more liquidy. Mm. And they use it in that very Provencal soup, so called la soup au piece too, where it's a vegetable soup, clear, with only summer vegetables, no winter, no carrots, no turnips, none of that. And then it's finished at the end, after the soup is on your plate, with a nice tablespoon of that fresh piece too on top of it. And then you have that olive oil and garlic flavor coming out because that cold sauce eat the hot soup and it just cover it. It's beautiful. I love that. Yeah. Well, and that's yeah, one of my... One of my favorite summer soup, I think. And it's simple. It, it's no complicate. It's just a soup. It's Nouvelle Cuisine. Yeah. Yep. The better yeah, part. I guess so. Yeah. Yeah. The, what, what you were intended to do yeah. before craziness happened. Yeah. So I guess mm -hmm. as we're coming to the end of uh, Verge for this section, right? Like, I think... It's well, I mean, I'm, I'm sure we could continue to go. I, I know um, we both knew that we were going to end up spending a lot of time on him. But, um, you know, unfortunately, we lost him, what, in 2015 at the age of 85. Yep. And mm -hmm. the Moulin de Moujan still stands to this day. It's actually it's a really cool. Uh, they have a really cool page on Instagram with some uh, some really pretty stuff. It's it's definitely not the same. But I mean, how could you expect it to be the same? And um, I know that my career will never be the same because of the time that I spent there. And, uh, yeah. What, what, how do you want to finish that? What, what else would you say here? I mean, there's so much great food in that region of the world. There's so many other things that we could talk about. Um, but I think we're, it's probably good if we leave it here. I think it's, we cover the basic one day. I would like to do something about, Talking basic, what is supposed to be? You like mean like when you talk about aioli? Like an aioli, exactly, or like a bouillabaisse, mm -hmm. or like a brandad, or like a daub, mm -hmm. with that Provencal beef stew. But it has regulation, it's not whatever. Right. So one day I would like to do a little talking about what things supposed to be and not using name just because you think it's the cool. name sounds good and you're adding it to whatever. I think it'd be cool to get something like that. We can do that. But I know you a guy. have about 10 minutes? Seven minutes to talk, to talk about Chapelle. Yeah, okay. So let's uh, let's talk about Alain Chapelle. I mean, let's uh, let's go there, right? Alain Chapelle, he, um, he was... Well, you kick it off. <laughs> <laughs> so Chapelle was born December 30, 1937 in Lyon. We talk about Lyon almost every show because it's the, the place of where France is. And he was, his restaurant was in Mionnet, which is 12 miles out of Lyon. Right. To and finish, what we, he was born there and he died July 10, 1990. He was 53 years old, super young. We never saw all of what he can do. He was, I guess, at that time, Obviously, one of the people who create Nouvelle Cuisine and maybe the, the one with the most modern thinking on his head. He when came you, from Point, his, right? He came from? Ferdinand Point, right? Yeah, he trained with Point. Yes, definitely. But then you said he was the yep. most forward thinking. And why, why, why do you say that? Because when you see, I mean, you just take his book the one you, you have there, that, that guy. Mm -hmm. And when you open the book, that the book is divided in two sections. He has half of the book, it's called The Recipe from the Tradition. And then the other half of the book is The Recipe from Imagination. And when you look at the things he came up with at that time, it was by far 
the most out there. Do you, um, would you like to translate one of these or I don't know, which one do you think you maybe want to talk I think about? When, I think when you talk about Chapelle, you have to talk about that little foie gras, uh, foie de volaille, chicken, chicken liver? liver, chicken liver, who he added marrow to it to make that mousseline. And that, that, that's one of the, I guess, the number one selling item on his menu. Le gâteau de volaille au foie blanc. And he served that with a little kind of ragu of... Crawfish. Um, look, it's crayfish, I guess, a yeah. crevice. Yeah. Yeah. So when you look at it and you think that way, <laughs> that, that was more or less... Uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Like when you surf and turf. <laughs> yeah you know yeah you have chicken on the bottom and crawfish on top of it it was like a very avant-garde mm -hmm. surf and turf yeah for sure <clears throat> so if we because we don't have much time so we should mention it's always a guy you get obviously three michelin star mm -hmm. get one in 67 two in 69 and three in 73 and Things who is amazing to think when he get his third one, 1973, it was the 19 restaurant one nine. who have it. One nine. Yeah. Yeah. Today, I think they have 63 star only in France without going away. Like how many three star restaurants out there? It, it, it's, I don't know, a lot more than 19. Google it real quick. Yeah. Uh, France has 30, having three. 30? So it's 65 total? Um, Maybe. Stand by. It doesn't matter. Yeah. <laughs> it's interesting to know for sure. Yeah. 135. Can you imagine? Around the world. He was, he was number 19. Yeah. Yeah. And that's 1973. It's not, we're not talking about 300 years ago there. Right. 50, 50 years ago. Well, 49. Yeah. One of the things also who I didn't know, the, the Roux brother, you know, the two French brothers who went to London and opened Le Gavroche. Mm-hmm. Who I think became one of the first three star Michelin in, in, in England. Mm -hmm. Their son, Michel Roux Jr., mm -hmm. apprentice under Chapelle. I didn't know that. The world gets small. The world of phenomenal cuisine gets very small. I, I would say, yeah. Everybody knows everybody, and then it's very hard to. With internet and all of that, it's very hard not to know what's happening. Because it's all there. It's all coming at you. You open your computer in the morning and the stuff's coming from everywhere. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. But Chapelle, for me, when I was a young chef, when I started making that collection of this book, he was the one I spent the most time reading. Because he was a little bit more different. And I, I like the fact that he was different. It's a guy who, and like we mentioned, that would go and see every farmer he buy food from it. He would talk to them. He would sit, get a glass of wine. And can you grow that for me? I know we don't do it no more, but I would like to have it for the restaurant. He, it's a, he's a hunter. He would go hunt. He loves dog and go out and huge walk in the forest. It was, I think it was a kind of a, quieter chef okay he was not always in front of tvs and things like that that was the bocuse guy mm -hmm. i think chapel was a lot more on his i don't know i think you say in english reserved. quiet no little yeah reserved, res reserved. Yeah. yeah yeah i think he, he lets his things coming out on his food you know he, on his food he was not reserved at all but as a person he was kind of a reserved guy 
Yeah, that was the the yeah. most recent picture I think I had, or I was able to get of him. Yeah, it's a beautiful uh, line of frying pan or whatever you are behind him. Yeah, little cocottes or something like that. Yeah, nice and clean, huh? Yeah, little shine to them, just a little. <laughs> just before the picture, yeah. Oh, I'm sure. Yeah. They were hanging the last one while the camera was getting set up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, you see that in TV show now. I know, no day. Yeah, today is the same thing. Yeah, you you have these TV show. They go to restaurant. You show them recipe, and Frank Pandy uses brand new. He just came out of the box. Yeah, but that's one of his dish. Huh? The, the, the TVA the duck dish. It's a PTVA of duck. Yep. That was something he was known for it with the two souls. Mm -hmm. It's beautiful looking even today. Yeah. It's I technique. Mean, I, I, beautiful technique. Yeah. Yeah. What are these two sauces? Do you know offhand? No, not offhand. No. I mean, it looks delicious. It's beautiful. Yeah. What a nice dish to see come to the table for a party of four or six. Yeah. Can you imagine? Yeah. The, the maitre d cutting the things, putting it on a new plate, pouring more sauce. Yeah, I can, I can see that. I don't know if it's in the one of the recipe on the outside of the book. Maybe. Yeah. And I don't see it. So, yeah, I think that's... I'm looking... Yeah. No, I don't see it. Not on the outside of the book, no. You have to go inside and find it. We'll have yeah. to do some digging. Yeah, we need to do some digging. Yeah. So I feel but like... We, I mean, we... Go, go ahead. ahead. I say, well, I think we cover Verger very well. We kind of went very fast <laughs> over Chapelle. But that's okay. We It's another guy out there. It's, it's more than... <laughs> yep. That's funny. Well, I mean, he definitely brought a lot to the table. Um, he 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 introduced. Go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. One of well, the, one of the things we say. Remember, he was uh, one of the guys who still use Chapel idea. Is that it's Eston Blumendale at the Fat Duck. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's a lot of his away. dishes are based off of Chapel. Yeah. Yeah, I, I didn't know that. I didn't know that anybody was a fan like he is. Yeah. Yeah. Well, well, I guess geographically it makes sense. I, I think that, you know, in in Bray, I would say that Bray is probably like what nor the north of just north of Lyon is. I, I could see it being very similar from uh, from a hunting perspective, from a fishing perspective. Um, yeah, you may be right. It would make sense. It would. I, I get Blumenthal, the guy who look outside the box and he again. Reading Chapel, you see that he was looking outside the box too. So I guess makes sense. Then these two things get together. It makes perfect sense. Yeah. And I guess I get one other thing. It's important to recognize is that you know we we were just talking about this. They call Lyon the 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 capital of gastronomy in France, right? It's where the Bocuse d'Or is held. And um, I, I I I should have put the overlay in here, but. You know the the Trois Gros restaurant was was nearby. Um, we talked about um, you know obviously the restaurants in Lyon, Paul Bocuse, and then in Mionnet we have um, Chapelle. Uh, I know in Rouen was um, sorry, brain stopped working. The... Yeah. Um, Anyway, I know there's well, restaurants you know, the in Rouen, and Clermont Ferrand was uh, Bernard Loiseau. I mean, there's so many of these people, and and well, and, and you were saying like the, they would have coffee together, right? These are the yeah, these are the people who move forward Nouvelle cuisine, and they would have coffee together. They hung out like this is this is what they did, and this is what I believe is probably a big part of why. This is the gastronomic capital of France. Even even Roger Verge, he was born just north of Lyon. He found his way yep. south, yeah, but it's still, I mean, it's what, three hours, I think? Three and a half? I, I know by yeah, maybe. By TGV, it's an hour and forty. Like it's it's not far. 
No, not anymore. Back no. then, maybe a little it, different, but now, yeah, it's not much. No, it's easy. You can go there for dinner and come back at night and be at home for, for, for sleeping. Yeah. Easily. Now sure. with the TGV, yeah. 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 Yeah, it's just funny how everything seems so small. Yeah. Well, the world gets smaller. Yeah. For sure. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know if it's a good thing or a bad thing, but that's the way it is. It's the way it is. And that's how good cuisine gets passed on from mentor to student, for sure. Mm -hmm. Absolutely right. So yep. speaking of, I feel like um, in, the, in a month, when we get together for our next culinary history lesson, I feel like we should talk about Le Nôtre a little bit. I feel like it's about time to talk about uh, the pastry side of things, which will probably challenge both of us a little bit. Um, yeah, maybe just a little. <laughs> and um, I mean, let's see. Who else? Do we start talking about um, the next generation, Ducasse, or do we still have some Nouvelle Cuisine names that we should hang around with? <laughs> some of the classical, some of the from the beginning. Mm -hmm. hmm. So do we talk, do we cover Michel Guerard? Not well. We but mentioned his be... name, but we haven't dove in yet. That's yeah, that's true, especially with uh, my. You were talking. You were talking about Rohan early. That's where the trog hole is. There we go. Thank you. Yeah, all of a sudden he's like Rohan. That's trog hole. Yeah, but I mean, yeah, a guy like maybe Gerard would be. Would yeah, be with La, La Cuisine Mansur and La Cuisine uh, Gourmand. Which would be yeah. that's all the way over here on the on the west coast. Yep. Yep. But that would be kind of cool if you do we do the pastry guy and then we do Michel Gerard. Okay. Cool. And you met him, so you you know a little bit about him, you know how nice he is. Yeah. Le Pré du Génie is beautiful. I'd love to talk about that. Okay. Okay, that's that's what we do next. That'll cool. be cool. I'm fine with that one. Sounds good. And like you said, I'm going to have to dig on my pastry background. <laughs> It'll be good for both of us. Yeah, I guess, yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you, Chef. This has been, uh, as always, a blast. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. It's always fun. I love it. It's okay. interesting. If it takes a lot of things out of me, then I kind of, over the years, forget. And all of a sudden you go, oh, man, that's true. That was the guy. Well, it's just... Yep. I mean, it's funny for me to, to actually hear where it comes from, where it came from, to know, again, like the things that happened before I was even cooking. Not yeah. 200 years before, but 15 years before. But before, yeah. Yeah. I think one of the subjects one day we, we should do, it's going like taking a guy maybe... Maybe maybe Wolfgang Puck, mm. you know, who created some kind of California cuisine. Mm -hmm. So the dude is from Austria. He worked in Switzerland, worked in France at the Beau de Beaumaniere. That's why he speaks French so well. Mm. Okay. And then went to the U.S. and 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 started a whole new things about food in in the U.S. And I think it'd be cool to. Talk about that, how he creates Pago and why this and why that. And I think it's it it will be also a good subject. Well, and on that same on that same vein, I would love to talk about Jean Louis Paladin, who was Paladin, yeah. Yeah, that yeah. I mean he was very much so ahead of his time. Yeah. Again, another one who died a lot too young and too early. It did never show us all what he had. Right. Yeah. It's funny to sit back One and wonder what might have happened. You know, what else might yeah. they have come out with, you know? Yeah. One of the nicest cookbook ever. Yeah. The Paladin. I love that. Do book. you have that? Yeah. You have it? Yeah. Yeah. 1986, 85? 
it's I don't know. I know it's old like hell and I love it. Stunning. It's a beautiful book. I'm trying to think of if it's in if it's in an arm's length, but I know I know it's here. I just can't tell you where exactly it is. Yeah. But yes. Yeah, yeah, mine is in the it's in the living room. <laughs> I don't I don't keep it here. It's in the living room. It's with the other books. So yeah, with the the the, the top of the things, yeah. For future, yeah. for future lessons. So, yes, yeah. sir. Come back That's around cool. if you want to see some of those. Um, yeah, feel free to enter uh, any questions in the chat if you have them. Um, if you spent the last hour and ten minutes with us, thanks for listening to us, and uh, hope to see you again in the future. So, uh, Chef, thank you again. Always a pleasure, and uh, we'll get Always together for our next session mid October. Okay. We we find a date and we we talk about it. Of course, yeah. We'll okay, post, we'll post that up. All right. So, okay. thank you, Chef. Talk thank to you, you soon. Chef. Talk to you soon. Have bye a good bye. night. Thank you all. Bye bye. Have a good night. Good night, everybody. <laughs>